right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for braving the rain to join us today. So apologize for the late start. Wanted to give you a chance to uh, uh, consider the presence remarks after the uh, after the pool spray or during the pool spray today before <laughs> we went to your questions. But uh, now that you've had an opportunity to do that, let's go straight to your questions. Julie, do you want to start? Thanks, Josh. Um, I wanted to start with the Iran compromise on the Hill. Uh, has the White House seen the language, and um, would the president still veto this compromise that's emerging? Well, Julie, there is a, a markup that is scheduled for later today in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And so in the context of uh, this briefing, I won't be in a position to be uh, ultimately definitive of, about whether or not we'll be able to support the product that emerges. But there is some greater clarity I can offer you in terms of our position. Uh, the first is we've had what I think what I could describe as four specific concerns with the way the Corker legislation was introduced. Uh, the, one of the, the one that I have talk, I've talked the most frequently about in public uh, is the requirement for the administration to certify that Iran has not backed terrorism against Americans. Uh, and this idea that we could essentially get Iran to renounce terrorism is unrealistic. We've acknowledged on the front end that this nuclear agreement, if we can reach one, will not in any way resolve all of the concerns that we have with Iran's behavior. And in fact, uh, one of the reasons we're trying to reach uh, an agreement that would prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon is because we know they are um, a backer of terror activities around the globe. So that's, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that the legislation as introduced had a rather long review period of 60 days uh, that would essentially delay implementation of the bill until um, uh, this rather slow-moving Congress had an opportunity to consider it. Uh, by uh, carving out such a long window for them to review the agreement, it could delay uh, over a long period of time the implementation of the agreement. Uh, after all, it's difficult to expect that our uh, partners in this process and even uh, the Iranians would beginning to take important concrete steps uh, before the United States had definitively indicated a willingness to keep up our end of the bargain. So uh, a long delay like this in the implementation of the agreement could threaten the very agreement itself. Uh, the third thing is that the legislation as introduced did not adequately clarify that a future congressional vote would be focused on the sanctions that had been passed by Congress. Uh, and this goes back to a principle that we've articulated on a number of occasions, which is that the President of the United States is the one who is given the authority under the Constitution to conduct foreign policy. Therefore, it is his decision to make, uh, uh, to make about whether or not to enter into an agreement. But we have acknowledged that Congress does have an important and legitimate role when it comes to uh, voting on the sanctions that Congress passed. Uh, the fourth thing, and what we have seen over the course of time uh, is that there are other extraneous elements that are not related to the substance of the agreement that sometimes float in and out of the conversations about what's going to be included in the text of the bill. Uh, and obviously, we would vigorously oppose any sort of extraneous element not at all related to the agreement that could undermine our ability to implement the agreement. So that's a long answer, but I did want to try to be specific with you, as specific as we could, about the concerns that we have raised about the uh, legislation that uh, Senator Corker introduced. Well, it seems like at least some of your concerns are addressed as part of this compromise. The review process would be shortened, uh, the language as it relates to Iran and in its support for terrorism uh, has been tweaked. So based on what you've seen, do you feel like your concerns have been adequately addressed to the point where the president could potentially sign this legislation? Well, based on the way that uh, they're talking about this, again, uh, there is a, a, a committee markup process that I both want to be respectful of. This is ultimately a legislative vehicle. Uh, at the same time, I, I would also uh, acknowledge that nothing uh, is final until the committee has had an opportunity to uh, conduct the markup and, uh, and cast votes. But uh, there are some steps that we have communicated to Capitol Hill that they could take to resolve many of the concerns that we have about this process and about this bill. Um, if you'll, I guess if you'll indulge me again, I can go through some of those as well. well I, just want, I just want to know if the concerns that you have that you've communicated to the Hill are being addressed okay. by this new compromise. Well, again, uh, it, based on the published reports uh, that are coming out, there's some reason to think that. But again, it's not. 
I can't say anything definitive about it until the process has been completed. But uh, well, let me go through. You're sounding more optimistic about <coughs> this potential legislation than obviously the original corporate legislation. Well, it sounds like. let's let's walk through these changes and uh, or what what we have what, the kinds of changes that we've asked for, and then we can uh, have a conversation about what our posture would be, which would simply be that if we uh, arrived at a place where the bill that is passed by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee with bipartisan support uh, essentially is a vote to vote later on congressional sanctions uh, and not a not the decision about whether or not to enter into the agreement, uh, that would certainly resolve some of the concerns we've expressed uh, about the authority that is exercised by the President of the United States to conduct foreign policy. Uh, the second thing is, uh, as you pointed out, the reports indicate that the link to this terrorism certification measure has been removed. Uh, that certainly would be consistent with the objections that we raised earlier. Shortening the review period is obviously an important part of this. We wouldn't want an unnecessarily or, or at least an unreasonable delay when it comes to implementing the agreement. Um, the other thing that we would want uh, members of the committee in bipartisan fashion to confirm uh, is that this piece of legislation would be the one and only mechanism for codifying precisely what the appropriate congressional oversight is into this matter, uh, and to be specific about the way that Congress would vote on the sanctions that Congress put into place. Uh, and that bipartisan agreement is uh, critical to making sure that there, you know, frankly, that there isn't an untoward effort to insert a different provision into some sort of must-pass piece of legislation that could really gum up the works here. So uh, getting bipartisan agreement on that uh, is important. Uh, and then finally, uh, if we could uh, clarify Congress's role through, by taking all of these steps, shortening the review period, being clear about what it is that they're voting on, making clear that this is a vote to vote later on congressional sanctions, uh, that that would actually achieve, uh, at least in part, what the President has established as the priority here, which is to ensure that our negotiators have the time and space that's necessary to reach an agreement if one can be reached by the end of June. Uh, and if presented with a compromise along the lines that I just laid out here, uh, that would be the kind of compromise the President would be willing to sign. And is that the kind of compromise that you believe is being worked on on the Hill right now? Well, again, uh, based on public reports, based on uh, the what you would expect to be the substantial number of conversations that have been taking place between senior administration officials and Democrats and Republicans on the Hill. Uh, that is what we anticipate they're going to discuss. Uh, but again, I, I, I can't say anything definitive about this until uh, there has been an actual markup and a debate within the committee uh, and a vote, uh, in part because what we would like to see out of this process is a uh, bipartisan vote uh, that's, that reflects uh, these concerns that we've raised and these efforts to try to find some common ground. Okay, I just want to move back quickly to two so, other yeah. more Thank you for indulging me on my long answers. Do you have any update on the timing of um, taking Cuba off the state sponsor of Terror List? Uh, I don't have an update uh, in terms of timing, but stay tuned. Okay. Um, and also on the meeting uh, on Iraq today, a body came here <coughs> seeming to want more military support from the United States. The President offered $200 million in humanitarian aid. Can you be more specific about what a body was asking for, and did the president offer anything in terms of military aid in the private conversations that they had? Well, I, I do want to be clear about one thing. My understanding, based on the readout that I've received of the meeting, I obviously was not in the uh, in the Oval Office when they had a, a rather extensive conversation. There was no specific request that Prime Minister Abadi presented in terms of additional military assistance. Prime Minister Abadi is obviously interested in uh, affirming the commitments that the United States and our coalition partners have made to uh, offering up equipment, uh, training, uh, advice and assistance, uh, and even military strikes that back uh, Iraqi security forces on the battlefield. Uh, the President obviously both in private and in public uh, reaffirmed uh, the commitment of the United States and our coalition partners to this effort. Uh, we understand that the strategy that we've been pursuing to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL uh, is one that has uh, an important role for Iraqi security forces to play. Uh, we also understand that the coalition, uh, that the United States and our coalition partners are invested in uh, the success of those Iraqi security forces. 
uh, this, the success will also depend on the willingness and commitment of the Iraqi government to unite that country and to govern in an inclusive, multi-sectarian fashion. Uh, and we've been gratified that Prime Minister Abadi, at, uh, on many occasions, has reaffirmed his commitment to those principles. Uh, but you know, we understand that this, that obviously the Iraqi security forces are an important part of this strategy, and the United States and our coalition partners uh, remain committed to offering them the assistance uh, and support and backup that they need to continue doing their important work. Okay. Roberta. So were there specific requests or offers made in terms of that backup for the for Iraqi yeah. security Again, forces? Again, Roberta, there were no specific requests that were made by the, uh, by the Iraqi Prime Minister. Um, as you know, um, low, low oil prices have um, hurt um, Iraq and, and other oil producers for that matter. But did the Prime Minister act, ask for any financial help for, for his country or um, financial help in terms of paying for um, any kind of military aid? <laughs> uh, I, I can, in terms of any requests for financial assistance, I can look into a uh, more detailed readout of the meeting. There may, be some, may, there may be a way for us to help you out on that a little bit more. Is the U.S. government um, about um, Iran stepping in, and, and to what extent did the, the um, president and prime minister discuss those kinds of concerns? Well, I think as the president indicated in the uh, in the Oval Office just moments ago, that uh, there was an extensive discussion uh, about this, and uh, as the president indicated, the expectation would be that two neighboring countries would have an important relationship, uh, and uh, obviously we understand that that. Uh, that relationship is important because of the uh, large uh, Shia population inside of Iraq. Uh, you know, obviously their security is dependent on good relations with their neighbors. Uh, but what we would also want to make sure uh, is that, that the concern for that relationship doesn't obscure the responsibility that the central government in Iraq has to lead a diverse country uh, and to pull that country together to counter the threat that is posed by ISIL. Uh, and uh, again, this is what the, the President said in the Oval Office. That, that is the accurate characterization of the, the private conversation that they had. And uh, we have been gratified by the sustained public support for those principles that Prime Minister Abadi has articulated. Okay. Jim. Uh, you said that uh, the Iraqi Prime Minister made no specific requests, but did he make any general requests? Did he say to the President, we need more military assistance just in general terms? Uh, again, there, there was no. Uh, I know that there were some published reports leading up to this meeting that indicated that he was going to, you know, come, you know, walking in with a stack of papers with uh, a checklist of, of, uh, you know, ammunition and body armor and you know other military equipment that they need. Uh, and what I'm telling you is that there is no s sort of request like that that was proffered. Uh, Not even from the Iraqis in general, the Iraqi government has not. Well, again, as I as I mentioned, I think in response to Julie's question that the. Uh, the whole reason for having uh, a meeting like this is so that the two leaders can sit down uh, once again and talk about the important aspects of our, of the relationship between our two countries. Uh, obviously part of that uh, relationship and an important part of that relationship right now is the security assistance that the United States uh, is providing to Iraqi security forces as they take the fight on the ground to ISIL in their own country. Uh, the President remains committed to that effort and supporting uh, that effort. There's also a role for our coalition partners to play, by the way, as well. Uh, so uh, I guess the point is there was no specific request that was offered in terms of stepped up military assistance. Uh, but obviously there is interest in both sides in making sure that we protect the strong cooperation uh, that exists between uh, the United States military and Iraqi security forces. And, and is, is there anything in those published reports about those specific requests that, that the White House uh, is saying at this point, you know, that that's that's not happening. Well, my understanding is that the published reports indicated a prediction that Prime Minister Abadi was going to show up at the White House with a uh, an invoice, if you will, uh, and that, that part is and that's not true. That did not occur. And on the uh, Corker compromise, uh, to follow up on Julie's question, um, I thought it was interesting that you you said that you would like to see some assurances from Congress uh, that you don't have sort of one piece of legislation after another, and that this continues on an indefinite. Uh, fashion, but I suppose just one piece of legislation could become a, a precarious uh, situation in terms of you know you, you, everybody has put every you know possible hope and, and prayer on this piece of legislation passing, and, or else there's no nuclear deal. Are you concerned that this could set up sort of an Iran nuclear cliff 
of uh, some sort if, if it, you know, this gets bogged down uh, up on Capitol Hill? No, I, I don't have that concern. Uh, again, based on the terms that we've been talking about and based on the efforts that we have made to ensure that our negotiators have the time and space that they need to reach this agreement. Uh, first of all, what's important for people to understand about the, this legislation is that it essentially is a vote to vote later on congressional sanctions, uh, not, a, uh, not a specific vote uh, about the decision to enter into an agreement. Uh, and that's an important clarification, and it's important for everybody to uh, understand that. The other thing that would be included in this legislation is that it would also uh, clearly codify the appropriate oversight that Congress uh, can and should play in terms of uh, this agreement. And what we would seek and what we're seeking a bipartisan commitment on uh, is a commitment that this will be the vehicle for doing those two things, for you know, laying out the terms of a vote and for codifying the, the appropriate congressional oversight. And what about the earlier concerns that you had, you expressed, uh, other people in this administration expressed, that, th that uh, these, these nuclear negotiations that are ongoing right now that have to be completed by June 30th are, are sort of the purview of the executive branch mm -hmm. and that th this is not a proper place for the Congress to be asserting itself. Uh, are, you, are you sort of backing off of that? Uh, not backing off that at all. Uh, what we have sought is you clarification. Are, it sounds like you are cracking that door open to some sort of involvement. Uh, no, uh, we're not. Um, what we have said all along is that the proper role for Congress in this effort, and there is one, uh, the proper role for Congress in this effort is the consideration of the sanctions that Congress put in place themselves. Uh, and again, if we're able to reach a compromise, which seems to be emerging through the committee, the compromise would uh, set up a vote to vote later on those specific congressional sanctions. So they would uh, check a box, essentially, to say that well, it's I, not an up or down vote anymore on the deal? Is that, is that what uh, That's correct. It would not be an up or down vote on the deal. Uh, and that is something that we have opposed for some time for exactly the reason that you're stating. Uh, but uh, that, that, however, as we've also long insisted, uh, that does not mean there is uh, not an important role for Congress to play. There, in fact, there is. There's been an important role for Congress to play from the beginning. You'll recall that uh, you know, several years ago when Congress put in place these tough sanctions against uh, Iran, uh, they did their part to put these sanctions in place. The administration did our part in terms of working very closely with the international community to uh, coordinate those sanctions so that they didn't apply just to the U.S. but to countries around the world. This had a a very negative effect on the, Rus on the uh, Iranian economy and uh, in such a way that it caused the uh, Iranian currency to be significantly devalued. We saw oil export exports from Iran uh, plummet. We saw economic projections uh, about the Iranian economy uh, dramatically reduced. Uh, and that ultimately is what compelled Iran to the negotiating table. So there has been a role for Congress to play. Uh, and we, that's also why the administration has worked hard to stay in close touch with Congress about uh, these ongoing diplomatic efforts. And just in the last 12 days, there have been more than 130 calls that have been placed to members of Congress by the President, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, and other senior administration officials. Uh, oh, just in the last two days, Secretary Kerry, Secretary Moniz, Secretary Liu uh, conducted classified briefings uh, to which every member of Congress was invited. So this commitment to robust congressional engagement is one that we take very seriously. And just very uh, quickly and finally, um, the, uh, the reports that uh, ISIL has seized a, an oil refinery uh, in Baji, uh, 25 miles from Tikrit. Um, is that a worrying sign? Uh, there, there's been a lot of discussion in the last week or so that you feel like gains have been made, territory has been retaken. Uh, but I, I, would, I would assume that that is a, an area of concern if, if that is has indeed happened. Well, I haven't, I haven't seen those reports. The thing that I uh, am aware of is that this oil refinery site near uh, Baji is, or Beji, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, uh, but is one that has been in um, uh, the, the source of a, a lot of fighting for a number of months now. So, um, uh, but I, I don't know the current status of that. I'd encourage you to check with the Department of Defense about that. Okay, Margaret. Okay. Um, are, are you guys asking, um, your counterparts in Congress to let you know exactly which members are attending, have attended, or will attend these briefings? Like, are you keeping tabs on who's there and who's not, and is that something you share with us? Uh, I don't know if uh, we're keeping a list like that. I suspect that we're not. I think the way that this usually works is, uh, you know, a room fills with people, and then 
Um, it's it's people in Congress or you know, legislative officials who are responsible for manning the door, if you will, uh, moving the velvet rope. I assume that there's one at the opening of the room, uh, and then our guys just file into the front and offer up the offer up their presentation. So I don't know that we have any sort of list like that, but it certainly is a provocative question you're asking. That's shocking. I never try to ask provocative questions. So, I mean, I was mission accomplished. You had said uh, to us yesterday that um, there were some people who were never going to vote in favor of this compromise, and basically, because for partisan reasons. And I'm wondering how, if you're trying to keep tabs on that, or if it really matters, or not really. Well, it matters insofar as we think this is a very serious national security issue, and that it deserves the appropriate attention from members of Congress. And it certainly is not something that should be placed. Uh, below partisanship when it comes to the rank order of priorities. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen too many Republicans who've been interested in trying to capitalize on this situation uh, to score some partisan political points. And that's uh, rather unfortunate. I, don't, I think that there would be uh, plenty of people all across the country uh, in both parties who would not be supportive of that kind of approach to this issue, given the consequences it has for our national security. But ultimately, every member of Congress is going to have to decide for himself or herself about how they're going to um, handle this responsibility. A little politics question also. Um, I, I guess we could ask the president next time we had a chance. But I'm wondering how he's keeping tabs on 2016 now that it's really kind of up and running. I mean, um, you know, did he watch the burrito bowl video? Um, is, is he getting like a little politics briefing every day where he's trying to stay caught up on this kind of stuff, or is he trying to ignore all of it? And he said, you told us yesterday um, that one reason that he was not likely to endorse a Democrat before the nomination is that some of his friends may still jump in. Besides Hillary Clinton, some of his other friends may yet get into the race. And uh, then we read that uh, Joe Biden told regional reporters whatever he told them. And I'm just wondering, is, is, it, Joe, is it Joe Biden that you're talking about? Is it or are President Obama and Martin O'Malley dear friends and we just didn't know that? Or what, what were you talking about? I think the point that I was trying to make, uh, obviously, uh, you know, Governor Chafee was a very strong supporter of, uh, of, of uh, then Senator Obama's presidential campaign. Um, the, the point that I was trying to make, uh, maybe it was a little flip. Um, I have a tendency to do that in the same way that you have a tendency to ask provocative questions, uh, sometimes to my detriment. Uh, the point that I was trying to make is that this is uh, the outcome of the Democratic primary process is one that will be determined by Democratic voters. Uh, and they should be the ones to play uh, a role in choosing the next Democratic nominee. And that's what's most important. Uh, I, uh, that doesn't mean that the President uh, won't make an endorsement in the primary. Obviously, uh, he does that in lots of other situations. Uh, but. The point is that at this early stage in that process, um, the president has an interest in being respectful to the voters and allowing the voters to evaluate the candidates and, uh, and give the candidates or would-be candidates the opportunity to make a decision uh, about uh, getting in. And there are a variety of other uh, people uh, who have indicated uh, the possibility that they may uh, participate in the race. Uh, and the president wants to be respectful of the decision-making process that uh, those people have to make. Okay. Go ahead, Mara. On the Corker question, um, you said earlier that it's really important to make sure that there's not another untoward effort to insert language in some must-pass piece of legislation. So are you asking Mitch McConnell to give you some assurance that this is it? In other words, that there won't be any other Iran deal language uh, inserted anywhere else. I guess I'm a little unclear on what exactly you're asking for. Well, I think what we would like is we would like a bipartisan commitment. We would like Democrats and Republicans in the Senate uh, to commit to making investment in this uh, compromise proposal if it emerges from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in the form that I described. And that investment would mean that we would allow this piece of legislation to do two things. One is to uh, set up the vote to vote later on congressional sanctions uh, and to codify the proper role of congressional oversight into this matter. Uh, and uh, and that's, th that's where people should be invested. And we're asking for a commitment that, uh, that, that people will, will pursue the process uh, that's contemplated uh, in this bill. But that commitment, I mean, that's, that's a big ask. You're saying that you don't want the people who are opposed to this to try to amend something else 
or you're saying that you, I guess I'm not even sure what the commitment. Well, when you, you say opposed to this, you mean, I, I think that most Republicans have indicated uh, support for the proposal that Chairman Corker has put forward. Is that not, I mean, well, you, okay. you follow it more closely than I do. I could be wrong about that. But I, I think the point is, is that Chairman Corker has undertaken what is a serious effort to uh, to, to clarify uh, exactly what a congressional vote would look like. He's obviously asserted in uh, sometimes colorful terms about the need for Congress to vote. Uh, and he is also codifying in this uh, proposed compromise here the appropriate congressional oversight. And it's our view that if this is the path that Congress wants to go down, that this is a path that's worth investing in, uh, and it shouldn't be subjected, particularly given the stakes of these conversations, shouldn't be subjected to um, you know, any sort of untoward effort to uh, insert other provisions into other pieces of must pass legislation. So, Major. Okay. You gave a long answer to Julie's question. I'd like okay. to simplify it from my understanding. Okay. I tried and to I invite you to use. I didn't, uh, I didn't give a long answer to try to obfuscate. No, I, I tried to be as specific. Okay. But that's probably the only time in my career I'm going to ask you to fall back on some of the cliches that press secretaries always fall back on. <laughs> <laughs> so, is this a step in the right direction? Is it substantial progress? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, does this the emerging legislation that will go for a markup represent a qualitative improvement from the White House's perspective? from where it was and relieve most, if not all, of the anxieties you had that would have provoked a presidential veto? I see. Well, uh, let, me, um, let me observe a couple of things. Uh, the first is that, uh, I mean, we started this briefing by me observing that the Corker bill, as it was introduced, is one that the president continues to strongly oppose and would veto. Uh, so the fact that, you know, I've got a rather long list here of changes that we would like to see in the legislation. And if we can succeed in effecting those changes uh, and build bipartisan support for those changes, uh, then that would be the kind of compromise that the President would be willing to sign. So, um, so, that, so th that is what it is. The, the second thing that I want to so reiterate. The legislation that's now before well, the, the let me say one of the, fall well, in that continuum. Let me say one other thing about that, which is that I, I've described a number of times as a compromise, and I don't want people to gloss over that. Because there are, there continue to be, if the President were writing this piece of legislation, it would look substantially different. Uh, and, you know, one of the elements of compromise here is that they're taking this vote uh, prior to June 30th. Uh, and we've been, um, we've raised serious concerns about these kinds of votes occurring while negotiations are taking place. So, uh, you know, that's one element of this proposal on which the administration is willing to compromise. Uh, so I don't want to leave you with the impression that um, even if, uh, you know, Chairman Corker and other members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in both parties were willing to agree to this substantial number of changes that I've laid out here, uh, that we're going to be uh, 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 particularly thrilled about the legislation that emerges. I think rather what we would find ourselves is with is a, the kind of compromise that the President would be willing to sign. Does that make sense? Right. Okay. But where are we right now? Well, right now there is a, uh, a markup that's taking place or scheduled that, to take place. And what you've seen, does that represent substantial progress? Is it something that you believe is moving in the right direction? All the cliches that well, are I, I think what, part I, of this process. I think, Please use I, think, <laughs> <laughs> I think that all of uh, that my colleagues, <laughs> I think that all of my colleagues and I will be uh, monitoring the Senate Foreign Relations Committee markup process because we're obviously, we've obviously been engaged in extensive discussions with both Democrats and Republicans there. I, I'm not trying to be. As well as I do, markups are not designed to fail. Uh, no, they're not. Markups but are designed to pass and move things forward based on a consensus carefully nurtured within the committee and with the administration. Yeah. Well, I, I don't. we're looking at. Uh, uh, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, predict how things turn out when it comes to congressional action. Uh, what I, but I, I think it is appropriate for you to observe that we have moved from a place where the President uh, was looking at a piece of legislation that he was committed to vetoing. Uh, and after uh, the Republican chairman, working closely with the Democratic ranking member, uh, Ben Cardin, uh, have agreed to address 
a large number of the concerns that we've raised, uh, and to put in place a substantial number of changes that would address those concerns and provide the kind of clarity we need to give our negotiators the time and space to try to reach an agreement, uh, that that would be the kind of compromise that the President would be willing to sign. Uh, and I think that certainly uh, indicates uh, um, uh, an improvement uh, from, right, when you consider, I guess it's not a, a particularly controversial notion, that the notion that we've gone from a peace legislation that um, the President would veto to a piece of legislation that's, undergo that's undergone substantial revision such that it is now in a form of a compromise uh, that the President uh, would be willing to sign. That would certainly be a, a, an improvement. But uh, the reason I'm hesitant here is that I don't want to get ahead of the, uh, the committee markup process, that there's important work that they need to do. And frankly, we need to see that they're prepared to commit to it. And we need to pr be prepared to see that Democrats and Republicans are going to be prepared to commit to this and because all the other right, right. Okay. But, uh, but, but the, the bipartisan aspect of this is also important to us, and it's, uh, I don't want people to gloss over that as well. Right. Another topic. Uh, Russia's announced it's going to sell S-300s to Iran. The Israeli Prime Minister was on a conversation with, ben, with Vladimir Putin about this. He's very much concerned about it. Uh, obviously, on Capitol Hill, there are concerns being raised about this, that this is a bad, a bad thing generally. It raises questions about whether or not this deal should go through. Where does the administration come down on the propriety of the sales themselves and its relevance, if you see any at all, to consideration of the framework? Well, obviously, we have expressed our concerns directly to the Russians about the possible sale of this anti-ballistic missile system to the Iranians. Uh, this, that was conveyed in a conversation between uh, Secretary of State John Kerry and his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. The, Concerns that we have, though, uh, are, while significant, uh, are separate and apart from the ongoing negotiations that are aimed at preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, these are, uh, while, uh, again, while it's a substantial concern, uh, it's not a concern that's directly tied to the ongoing nuclear negotiations. Why not? Uh, because we have been clear about the, the fact. The argument is, why are they buying a missile defense system? if they don't intend to create armed ballistic missiles with which to fire? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think as I've observed on a number of occasions, these kinds of decisions, this decision-making process inside of Iran is rather opaque. Uh, and so trying to divine the intent of the decisions that they're making is difficult work. Um, but what is clear is that um, even if we're able to reach an agreement, at the end of June. That would prevent Iran from being able to obtain a nuclear weapon. Uh, we're still going to have a long list of concerns about their behavior. Uh, and it will uh, include everything from their threats against Israel to their support for destabilizing groups in the region to their support for terrorism to their unjust attention of uh, some Americans inside of Iran. Uh, we, can, we will continue to have some concerns about their, uh, about the weapons technology that they have. Uh, about their lack of respect for human rights, um, you know, other issues on which we've already been engaged in robust international uh, action to try to address as well. But all of that is separate from the nuclear agreement. In fact, because of this long list of concerns, that's precisely why we're trying to reach a diplomatic agreement to prevent them from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, that these, all these other concerns are uh, enhanced and made even more dangerous if we're talking about a nuclear armed Iran. Uh, that's why we're going to such great lengths uh, to pursue what we believe is the best possible way for us to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Very quickly, uh, when the decision is made on taking Cuba off the state sponsor of terrorism, is that a paper statement or is the President going to feel the need, need to inform us, inform the country about that? Uh, if there's an announcement about that, uh, then I would anticipate that that would come in the form of a paper statement. Thank you. Okay. John. Um, so on picking up the mail, what, your discussion with Major, you were talking about how Iranian decision making is opaque. It's hard to discern what, what's going on. What is the administration's read then on the big question? Uh, have the Iranians made a strategic decision by engaging in this agreement, the preliminary agreement? Have they made a strategic uh, decision not to pursue <coughs> nuclear weapons? Well, I wouldn't feel qualified to draw that assessment from here. But 
Well, let me try to answer that question by saying this, which is that they have made a serious commitment on a whole range of metrics that would prevent them from obtaining a nuclear weapon. What remains to be seen, and this is an open question, uh, is whether or not they're willing to live up to those commitments. Uh, and that's why, for all of the effort that we're putting into uh, ensuring that we can find common ground uh, with the Iranians, an agreement that they would agree to, that would prevent them from obtaining a nuclear weapon, it's just as important that we have in place the most stringent, intrusive inspections, set of inspections that have ever been imposed on a country's nuclear program. Because frankly, uh, that um, opacity is a cause for some concern. Uh, and it is why, as the National Security Advisor put it, our approach to these negotiations is to distrust and verify. Uh, and that is a, a critically important part of this agreement as well, and securing uh, Iran's cooperation with that sort of uh, inspections program, uh, it will also be a critical element of any deal uh, if one is able to be reached by the end of June. But I'm trying to understand, you, you say you don't want Congress, you're not adamantly opposed to Congress voting up or down uh, or in any way on the agreement itself, that that is the, that is the administration's job, that is the president's job. Is, is and that's, that's been the job of every president uh, back to George Washington, okay, that this so is the way that this has been laid out. So, so that, that's your position, mm -hmm. but you don't object if Congress is going to vote whether or not to uh, pull down sanctions. Well, these are, uh, that's true, and that's been our, that's actually not a, I've said a number of new things today. That's not, so, that's not something that's new. We've acknowledged that Congress would have a vote when it comes to the sanctions that they put in place. But if Congress uh, were to assess this deal <coughs> and vote to, uh, to, 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 to leave the sanctions in place, not simply not, not to take them down, but to leave them in place and, in fact, uh, tie your hands. I mean, some of the discussions have been whether or not to take away <coughs> the president's authority to do a, a, a temporary uh, you know, taking down of the sanctions. What's the administration's position on that? Because well, the, all that you're negotiating from your side is sanctions. What we're, well, the conversations that we're having with members of Congress right now is about a piece of legislation that Senator Corker has put forward that essentially is a vote to vote later. Uh, and that does set up the possibility down the line, John, where uh, after an agreement is reached, uh, after June 30th, if the international community has come together and secured uh, a solid commitment from uh, Iran about steps they're willing to take to limit and in some cases roll back critical elements of their nuclear program. And they've signed on to cooperate with the most intrusive set of inspections that have ever been imposed on a country's nuclear program. And the international community is willing to go along with it, then Congress will have to make a decision. Uh, and if there are members of Congress who are willing to step forward and say, we acknowledge, we've, we've reviewed the details because they'll have the opportunity to review the details of the agreement. If they review the details of the agreement, they hear from our scientists that this definitively prevents Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. They hear that our P5 plus one partners, that includes our, uh, some of our closest allies, including uh, the United Kingdom, Germany, and France, that includes some of the world's uh, other powers uh, in Russia and China who aren't uh, friends of ours on every issue that if all those people are signed on to it, uh, then members of the United States Senate will have to make a decision about whether or not they're prepared to walk away from that and disengage. Uh, and if they do, the question that they will then have to ask themselves is, what are they going to do to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon? If they're willing to flush down the toilet the best bet that we have for preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, then what is the option that they're willing to consider? I suspect that what many of them are going to say is the same thing that John Bolton said, which is that we should carry out a military strike. Uh, and that is a, that's a very dangerous proposition. It's certainly not consistent with the President's approach to these issues. But uh, the point is what the legislation that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is considering now uh, is a vote to vote later on congressional sanctions. And uh, I, don't, uh, I don't want to leave with the impression that that vote that they would take later uh, is inconsequential. Uh, it's an important one, uh, but it's one that uh, would not take place until uh, after an agreement is reached, if an agreement is reached. And even if the President agrees to this compromise deal that's coming through the Foreign Relations Committee, you'd still, under the circumstance you just outlined, I imagine see a very strong veto threat from the President on any provision that would 
you know, force those sanctions to well, remain there's in Well, no, there's no doubt, again, uh, there's a lot of ifs here, and I, yeah, yeah, I yeah. would acknowledge that. But sort of if you go through all the ifs, if Iran yeah, yeah. Uh, agrees to take the steps, if they agree to submit to the inspections, if the international community agrees, if it can be certified by our, uh, our top scientists, uh, if all those things are in place and there is a strong uh, international agreement about that, uh, then yes, the President would uh, be very vocal uh, in encouraging Congress uh, to be supportive of that international effort to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Okay, one other question on Iraq. Um, as you know, there have been uh, allegations of war crimes by certain Iraqi units that have been fighting ISIS, some of the same units that have been very strongly supported by Iran. Did this issue come up? Is the, what, what, what's the administration's uh, level of concern about that question? Iraqi military units that are accused of, of basically the same kind of war crimes that ISIS is. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't have a, a readout of that part of the conversation. But we can look and see if there's additional information that we can provide about that. As a general matter, what, the, what we have been clear about is the need for Iraqi security forces to both be accountable to the Iraqi central government, that they need to be under the command of the Iraqi uh, military, uh, and that they need to uh, conduct their operations with a healthy respect for human rights uh, and consistent with the kind of multi-sectarian vision that Prime Minister Abadi has laid out for the country. Are there any safeguards in place to assure that U.S. aid going to the Iraqi government, to the Iraqi military, doesn't end up in some of these units that, are, that, that have been accused of, of this activity? Well, the, the support that we provide to the Iraqi security forces and to the Iraqi military is obviously intended for those units that are under the direct command of the Iraqi military. and that's. Uh, that's the intent of that assistance. Okay. Peter. Um, I wonder if I can just clarify a little further. I'm sorry on this question of the legislation. Mm -hmm. I must have written this notes down wrong. But what I heard you say was that it would be okay to observe that we've gone from a piece of legislation the President would veto to a piece of legislation that's undergone substantial revision such that it's now in the form of a compromise that the President is willing to sign. Again, uh, assuming that it makes its way through the committee process consistent with the substantial changes that I've discussed here. So I guess the question is, if there are no further amendments, is the legislation as it's now been presented meet that test? Well, I, I don't think uh, it, the legislation hasn't been presented yet because it's still going through the committee process. Right. So, okay. Senator, let's just say for the sake of argument, the Senator Ernest, a Democrat from the American <laughs> Heartland, <laughs> calls up Dennis McDonough and says, I got to vote on this thing one way or the other. There are going to be no more amendments. Do I vote yes or no? Well, I think what we'll do is we'll wait for the, well, uh, let's separate that out. It depends on whether or not Senator Ernest serves on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Yeah. Yeah. He so does serve on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Yeah. Regarded uh, member regarded. of the committee, and he's looking for the, guidance from his president. Yeah, I can tell you that that, um, I can tell you that, that uh, uh, fictional member of Congress uh, will, would have heard frequently from the White House uh, about the committee's consideration of this piece of legislation, uh, and that if he were presented with a, uh, again, a, a, essentially a compromise proposal that has uh, addressed the concerns that we've laid out with the bill that was originally introduced by Chairman Corker uh, and accommodated some of these other things that would uh, make it a, a, a legitimate compromise, uh, then we would be in a position of asking both Democrats and Republicans uh, to support it. They'll ultimately have to decide for themselves. But again, it's going to make its way through that process. And we've been in regular consultation with senators who are participating in that process, but they'll have to decide for themselves. Well, ask this way then. Are you asking for further changes beyond what Senator Cardin and Senator Corker have agreed to? Uh, what we uh, have sought is, well, what we have indicated uh, is that if the legislative proposal goes through the committee process and emerges, again, with the changes that we've sought to make it a better compromise, then we've indicated that the President would be willing to sign it. So again, there are, there are it's not a, it doesn't mean that we would. Not, I say it, but it's not really the answer to the question. The question is, is, is the legislation that the two senators have agreed to, are you asking for further changes to it, or are you not at this point asking for further changes to it? Yeah. Well, I don't want to say that we're not asking for further changes to it, because there are lots of concerns that we continue to have about it. Right? That's what makes it a compromise. So that's why I'm unwilling to say that. But what, I'm, what, what I am willing to say is that uh, despite the things about it that we don't like, uh, enough substan substantial changes have been made 
that the president would be willing to sign it because it would reflect the kind of compromise that he'd be willing to sign. Okay. As it stands now, absent further changes, the president is willing to sign it, even though he didn't like all of it. He's well, willing to sign it. Uh, again, I, I, I don't mean to go, keep going back to this, but this is really important. As it stands now, is it still going through the committee? And that's why I'm unwilling to weigh in too definitively about this, is because we have to see what goes through the committee. And so I don't want to stand up here and say, oh, yeah, we support the thing. And then, you know, I come out of here and I turn on C-SPAN and it seems that somebody's added another provision to it and you ask me why we've changed our position. Well, that's, that's understandable if somebody okay. changes it, but that's okay. what we're asking is the current version of it because, okay. you know, well, Senator, Senator Ernest it gets a yes or no. <laughs> he does. Uh, and the, the, the current version is one that's still being debated in the committee. Uh, but again, what we have made clear to Senator Ernest and the Senate Democrats that actually exist, uh, and to, uh, <laughs> uh, what we have made clear to uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, is that uh, the President would be willing to sign the proposed compromise that is, work, that is working its way through the committee today. Hopefully that's a little more quotable. Okay. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. It's not for lack of effort, I assure you. So, April, go ahead. All right. Um, Josh, on, on uh, two other subjects. Um, and going back to the question that I asked yesterday, and you gave the answer where you said it was flippant, um, it was a flip answer. Um, when you're talking about the president's friends, the possibilities of them running for, for president, um, have, with this friendship, do these people come to him and say, look, I'm thinking about this. What kind of advice would you give me for a rollout, what have you? Uh, if they do, I, that's not something that I would talk about from here. Why not? Well, because uh, the president is um, uh, is first in, is entitled to be able to have some private conversations, and uh, if there are individuals who come seeking his uh, advice, uh, they often, but not always, will seek to do that confidentially, and uh, that's an entirely appropriate thing for them to ask and to. Uh, but you were very forthcoming, and when we asked if the president gives Hillary Clinton automatic support, you, you said no, and you talked about the friends, and could you at least say that some of them have come to him and, and said, you know, I'm thinking about it, or you, know, you, don't, you don't have to give names, we will assume, <laughs> but <laughs> I, mean, could you, I mean, could you at least say that some of them have come to him if they have? Uh, I, I, would not, I wouldn't say that because I just don't want to be in a position of, of reading out any private conversations the president may have had uh, about this. The president obviously has conversations with a, right, uh, a large number of people about a wide range of issues, including occasionally politics. Uh, but beyond that, I'm not going to be more specific. Okay. On another subject, today marks the year that the Nigerian girls went missing. Um, is there thought or is there proof in this administration that the case is, is, really, is cold? Because we've heard that many are concerned that the girls are many of sold off or other things have happened to them. What is the thought here in this White House? Well, you know, April for, uh, you know, for a year now, the people around the world uh, have been concerned about the safety and well-being of uh, those girls that were kidnapped. Uh, the United States has taken steps to try to uh, augment the capabilities of the Nigerian security forces to uh, counter the threat that's posed by Boko Haram, but also to try to find uh, the girls who were kidnapped. Unfortunately, this, this kind of kidnapping story is one that is becoming uh, all too familiar in Nigeria. You know, there's a, a, a recent report from Amnesty International out that indicates that um, there are a large number of girls in Nigeria uh, who have been victimized and in some cases kidnapped by Boko Haram. Uh, we continue to be very concerned about that and we continue to be supportive of the uh, efforts of the Nigerians uh, to counter the, the, the depraved tactics that are employed by Boko Haram. And it's really as serious about finding the girls and going up against Boko Haram as they want to present to the world community. And I ask that because in last August, when uh, the president held his Africa summit here in Washington, the president of Nigeria, good luck Jonathan, talked to a crowd of people, and uh, he was not as, uh, as serious, and I'm going to use that term, as serious about um, possibilities of finding them, as some would have thought here in Washington. Is there that concern that the Nigerian government, from this White House, that the Nigerian government <coughs> is not serious in, in, in finding the girls and in combating the other issues that you just spoke about at the podium? Well, uh, I think the first thing I'd point out is there actually is a government transition that's underway in Nigeria right now. That There was a presidential election that was held uh, just a couple of weeks ago. and. 
there is a, a democratic transfer of power that's preparing to occur uh, in Nigeria. So at this point, I probably wouldn't uh, offer up a, a for this transition. I'm speaking yeah. of Goodluck Jonathan last year here in Washington when he was indeed the president, not transitioning, hoping to remain president. I'm speaking of that time. Well, I didn't. I didn't see his comments. Uh, we certainly. Uh, I will tell you that everybody here in the United States, and I think people all around the globe, understand uh, the serious threat that Boko Haram faces. And I, uh, I would think that the political leadership in Nigeria, uh, based on the, um, the the toll of devastation that Boko Haram has left in its wake, uh, understands that this is a threat to the safety and security of that country and its people. And I'm going back to this conversation with um, Good Luck Jonathan last August. He was talking about countries that are helping to find the girls. And he really put on a pedestal, pedestal Israel and its efforts. Has the United States worked with Israel and the other countries uh, collectively or more kind of independently each group doing, each country doing something different to find the girls? Or is the United States working collectively with Israel and other countries to help find the girls? Yeah, the United States has taken efforts to both uh, augment the capabilities of the Nigerian security forces while also ensuring that those efforts are integrated with the international community that's responded uh, to this situation. Uh, that there is obviously a significant humanitarian need, there's a significant security need in terms of providing security to communities inside that country. Uh, and there's obviously an, an effort uh, underway to try to prevent uh, acts of terror. So there's a counterterrorism effort that's underway. Uh, and then there is this effort that's uh, to try to find uh, the girls that have been kidnapped. So there are uh, a substantial number of, of uh, operations uh, to try to address the many needs of the Nigerian people, uh, particularly as they try to counter the threat that's posed by uh, Boko Haram. And the United States is engaged in that effort. There's military personnel and uh, other personnel with specialized capabilities uh, who are working closely with Nigerians as they uh, confront this very difficult challenge. One year anniversary, is there hope? Uh, April, there's always hope uh, that, the, um, that the forces of good uh, will be able to overcome some of the uh, destructive, violent forces uh, that get a lot of attention in this world. Okay. Francesca. Uh, first, I have a question on Mr. Abadi's visit. And then, not shockingly, I also have a question on Iran. Uh, first, can you explain why there wasn't a joint presser today? I mean, the pool spray was quite lengthy. And so I just wondered what the thinking was on that. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, as, as you know, Francesca, the president took a, a question with the Jamaican prime minister last Friday when he was in Jamaica. Uh, the president did conduct a news conference on, on Saturday in Panama, where he took five or six questions from White House reporters. Uh, and so, just for the take, sake of time on the present schedule, uh, we did not have a formal news conference, but uh, the President did take two or three questions in the Oval Office during the pool spray with Prime Minister Abadi. Thank you. And then, uh, on the Corker Bill, I know you're hesitant to talk about the future, so I'd actually like to go back. So we've had lengthy discussions in the briefing room on the Corker Bill before today. And every time when it, we've talked about it before and reporters have asked you um, about the bill and what it would take for the administration to, su to support it, uh, if there was any way that, a, that the president would not veto it, uh, it we had been, you know, you really hadn't been saying anything, just saying that you would veto it before today. That's right. And, and so what I'd like to understand is what happened in between, he'll absolutely veto it, which you had just said yesterday, and now today suddenly there's compromises that can be made. And maybe he'll support it. Yeah, and what, what has happened uh, is in that intervening period is that there have been a substantial number of conversations uh, between senior White House officials, other senior members of the President's national security team, uh, and Democrats and Republicans on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, you know, I noted that the President had telephoned Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Senator Corker last week. Uh, you can tell this briefing's gone on for a little while and started to get tired. So uh, I, gave him a prom I gave him a nice promotion, I guess. Uh, the President had the opportunity to telephone Senator Corker last week uh, and have a conversation with, with him uh, about the Iran uh, agreement that had been reached the week before. I made clear in reading out that conversation that they did not engage in negotiations uh, around the legislation that Senator Corker had put forward. Uh, but there have been a number of conversations uh, with uh, Senator Corker at the staff level, uh, and there have been an even larger number of conversations uh, with uh, Ranking Member uh, Senator Ben Cardin. Uh, and other Democrats who serve on the for Senate Foreign Relations Committee to try to broker this, broker this bipartisan uh, compromise. And again, this is a, an effort that's not yet been completed because there's a committee process that uh, we need to respect. Uh, but 
what seems to be emerging is a substantially different uh, piece of legislation that clearly codifies the congressional oversight role in this process uh, and clarifies exactly what the congressional vote uh, on sanctions would be on. So essentially this bill to, um, or this vote to vote later uh, is a way for us to um, find that common ground where we acknowledge that Congress has a legitimate role to play when it comes to congressional sanctions, while at the same time protecting the President's authority to make a decision about this deal that is, in his mind, clearly our best bet for preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. And the other thing that I would acknowledge is something I think I've also acknowledged over the last couple of weeks, uh, which is that those negotiations uh, have taken place in private. Uh, and uh, I think that is part of what uh, makes them more likely to succeed if uh, both parties feel like, and when I say both parties, I mean uh, people on either end of the phone. Uh, that are not always members of different political parties. Sometimes they're the same political party. Uh, but when those conversations are taking place, that people can float different ideas uh, and offer up different proposals. And uh, again, we're going to have to sort of see how this works its way through the process. Uh, but you know, it certainly what we could be seeing here is uh, the kind of compromise emerge that the president would be willing to sign. To clarify on that point, because the conversations did take place in pri private. I mean, this is the first we're really hearing about this. And so what you're saying is that even in the last 24 hours, conversations have taken place, including one that presumably with Senator Corker and Senator Cardin, in which they said that they would introduce the bill the way that you're suggesting, with the, the compromises that you're suggesting, or at least that they would support, they would support those changes? Well, I don't want to read out any specific conversations, but uh, there have been frequent conversations, yes, even in the last 24 hours, uh, in which uh, the information that I described at the beginning of the briefing uh, was uh, extensively discussed, as you would expect. Thank you. So, yeah. Chris? Well, can you give us a sense of when you heard about what we now see as this version of the bill that we believe is going to go to markup, and I guess now at 245? Yeah. Well, I, you know, we've started to hear some elements of this uh, start to emerge uh, yesterday, at least I did. Uh, there may be some people who are more directly involved in these negotiations who were aware of this sooner. Uh, but I was certainly aware that there were frequent conversations that were ongoing between um, White House officials principally. Uh, but this obviously, as you would expect, included you know, input from Secretary Kerry and uh, officials at the State Department uh, and others. Uh, obviously, the Treasury Department has an important role to play here. They, they are, are the ones who are responsible for enforcing the sanctions. So there are a large number of people involved here, and that's, that's part of why you've seen such a large number of conversations that I've described uh, between uh, administration officials and members of Congress, even in just the last 10 or 12 days here, uh, more than 130 phone calls. Uh, and I, that's indicative of the uh, robust consultation that's been ongoing. Many of those conversations have not been focused on the legislation, but actually focused on the terms of the deal that was brokered uh, in Switzerland between the international community and Iran. But some of those conversations certainly did relate directly to trying to uh, find some bipartisan common ground, some compromise proposal uh, that the President would be willing to sign. And uh, that's a painstaking effort, and there's still some work to do in the committee. Uh, but that's where we stand right now. One of the many concerns that you've expressed about the Corker bill was that it could obstruct a nuclear deal. Does this remove an impediment to a deal? Well, it certainly addresses a lot of the concerns that we had that would have uh, undermined our ability to reach an agreement. The, you know, the first is uh, the long review period. Uh, what had been a 60-day review period appears to have been reduced to a 30-day review period. Uh, that's important because, as I mentioned, uh, if the world has to wait two months before they can implement an agreement that's been reached, that is going to undermine our ability to successfully implement uh, the deal. Uh, 30 days is, uh, I guess, probably long. I would characterize as longer than we would like, uh, but not entirely unreasonable. Uh, that's one example. The terrorism certification thing is something we've talked about a couple of times in here. Uh, it's unrealistic for anybody to expect that the administration would be able to certify that Iran has essentially renounced terrorism. Uh, and to make the agreement contingent on that kind of certification uh, is little more than a poison pill designed to ensure that the uh, agreement could not be implemented. So that's why it was such a priority for us to ensure that that provision uh, was uh, removed from the, from the bill. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to do, and this is something that the President also uh, spent a lot of time talking about just over the weekend in Panama, 
was ensuring that our negotiators had the time and space that they need to try to reach an agreement by June 30th. And by clarifying exactly what the congressional vote would be and by codifying what the congressional oversight is going to look like, uh, we can give uh, a lot of assurances to our allies and partners in these negotiations to make sure that they understand exactly what Congress's role in this is going to be. Uh, it also allows us to have a conversation with the Iranians, who maybe, uh, who I know are sort of looking warily at us across the negotiating table because we're driving a really hard bargain. They also want to make sure that if they make all of these uh, commitments that to limit their program, to roll back key aspects of it, uh, if they agree to these kinds of intrusive inspections, they want to make sure that the party on the other side of the table is going to be willing to uh, implement the agreement uh, that, that uh, to implement the agreement. And by uh, offering up some greater clarity about the congressional role, uh, we can ease any concerns that they may have about our ability to do that. So are you essentially saying that this could have the opposite effect of what you would have thought going into it, in that it actually maybe helps by sending a unified message? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think I would go that far, <laughs> to be honest with you. I don't think I would go that far. I think uh, what I would describe this as is a, a compromise. Uh, and Congress has articulated very clearly uh, and strenuously their desire to uh, vote uh, and the proposal that's been put forward to vote to vote later uh, is, uh, is a reasonable one and does reflect, along with all the other changes that we have called for, uh, does reflect the kind of compromise that the President would sign. Okay. Kevin. I want to take you um, back to the Iraq question. Is the administration's position that the strategy as it's currently undergoing in Iraq vis-a-vis uh, -vis fighting ISIS, is it working? Well, Kevin, there's no doubt that we, uh, by working closely with our coalition partners and supporting the uh, Iraqi security forces, that we've made important progress. Uh, that the latest estimate from, I believe this is from the Department of Defense, uh, is that 30 percent of the populated areas that ISIL previously controlled, or close to 30 percent of the populated areas that ISIS previously controlled, are no longer areas where ISIL has freedom of movement. Uh, and that's an indication that uh, important progress has been made. Now, uh, you know, obviously you have Iraq's second largest city, Mosul, that uh, is still under the control of ISIL. So uh, there is nobody who assumes that this uh, effort is done. Uh, but I think that we uh, are, can already see that this effort is having tangible benefits, both for the Iraqi people, but also for the national security of the United States. Is it your sense that there's frustration then on behalf of the administration that the so-called good news is not getting out? Uh, no. I think what we're focused on is making sure that uh, the strategy that the President laid out is one that we are uh, implementing to maximum effect. Uh, and that means working closely uh, with the more than 60 countries that are part of this international coalition. Uh, it means taking uh, as many steps as we can to deepen our cooperation with the Iraqi security forces and all of the forces that are under the command of the Iraqi military, to make sure they have the support they need to take the fight to ISIL on the ground in their country. We're seeing that when they're backed up by coalition military air power, their effectiveness on the battlefield is significantly enhanced. That's not a surprise to anybody, but it does reflect the successful and effective implementation of the strategy the President's designed. You are aware, then, of the circumstance in Tikrit today? Uh, maybe you could be a little more specific. Sure. Very, uh, very serious uh, death toll there once again. The battle is raging on once again in that city. In that city, it just sort of underscores this notion that whenever, it seems whenever the administration says things are moving in the right direction, we heard the vice president sort of allude to that. Uh, then there's this sort of slap back. Uh, are you not careful then to sort of proclaim progress? Well, again, Kevin, I, I, there's no doubt that important progress has already been made uh, in terms of. You know, there's 30 percent of the territory that ISIL uh, previously held in populated areas, or at least close to it, uh, is now areas where ISIL uh, cannot freely travel. Uh, and we, you know, in previous occasions when we've talked about Tikrit, I've been clear about the fact that we anticipate that these kinds of uh, op military operations are not going to move in a straight line, that there's always going to be an ebb and flow uh, to the conflict. So we're very mindful of that. Uh, but there's no denying the progress that uh, has been made, and there's certainly no denying that it's been important progress. I want to ask you uh, about uh, a report that uh, I read about uh, a possible ISIS training camp about eight miles away from the U.S.-Mexican border. Have you heard anything about that at all, and can you confirm that? Uh, I haven't. I can't confirm that. I'm pretty skeptical of that report, to be honest with you, but let me, let me check on it for you. Okay. okay. Drew. 
Does the White House believe that the Iraqi government has the capability to take back Anbar province? Something that took U.S. much better armed and equip equipped and trained U.S. troops years to do? Mm -hmm. Well, the obviously those kinds of decisions about the pace of military operations are going to be decisions that are driven by uh, Iraqi military commanders and the Iraqi government. And uh, I'm confident that they're going to be interested in consulting with the United States and our coalition partners as they consider these decisions. Uh, the Iraqi security forces can certainly count on the uh, support of our coalition partners, both in terms of, uh, of, of providing them equipment and training and uh, military air power uh, being in place to back them up. Uh, but ultimately, these kinds of broader strategic decisions are decisions that are going to be driven by uh, the Iraqi military and the Iraqi political leadership. The President today didn't make any new commitments in terms of military aid to Iraq. Should we understand from that that he believes they have all the, all the tools they need to carry that out? Well, uh, I think, as I mentioned earlier, that there, the Iraqis did make a specific request for military, uh, additional military assistance. Uh, what the Iraqis uh, sought to do and what the President sought to do uh, is to renew and deepen our commitment to the strategy that the President has put in place. And this is a strategy that's focused on making sure that Iraqi security forces have the training, equipment, and advice that they need to take the fight to ISIL on the ground in their own country. Uh, the United States has made the commitment to uh, engage in those training efforts and to provide a lot of that equipment. What we've also committed to do is working with our coalition partners to back up their ground operations with military air power. Uh, and that is a strategy that has yielded important progress so far. But there's uh, significantly, uh, there continues to be significant uh, important work uh, that remains to be done. Thanks, Josh. Okay. Cheryl, I'll give you the last one. Thanks, Josh. Um, a, a domestic budget question, if I could. Okay. Um, this morning, the House Appropriations Committee started releasing some of this year's spending bills, and they appear to be adhering to the spending cap. I, is the President still determined not to accept bills that don't lift the sequester? Putting, putting the sequester back in place would have a terrible impact on our economy. It's, that is a, that is a uh, proposal that is a non-starter in the mind of the President. And we have succeeded in the past, in the last couple of years, uh, in being able to work, Democrats and Republicans work together to find a bipartisan way for us to ensure that we're protecting critically important investments for this country. And the President is hopeful uh, that Republicans will abandon the partisan approach they've adopted so far and consider the kind of bipartisan approach that will make their legislation more likely to be signed into law uh, but also the kind of legislation that we know will have an actually will actually have a beneficial impact on the U.S. economy, uh, and not one that will undermine the economic progress that we've made so far. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks,